continue our series on legalism, and uh, I'll start by doing some review, uh, but we are going to talk specifically tonight about defeating legalism. That's where we were at in our lesson uh, before. Uh, we, were, we were talking about defeating legalism, and that's where we're going to continue. But let's read some scriptures first and then uh, share a few thoughts with you. Romans 8, and uh, let's read verses 2 through 4. Um, let's read these verses out loud together. All right, Romans 8, beginning verse 2 down to through verse number 4. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. All right, good good few verses here. We'll come back and share a few thoughts, but let's turn over to Romans chapter number 13. Romans chapter number 13. And uh, read a few verses here. Um, I'll read these. You can follow along. I'm reading Romans 13, beginning verse number 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. You notice the uh, relationship here between love and the law. Okay, there is a connection here. And um, the Bible does tell us that we owe love to each other. Okay, um, we, that means that, that we're obligated, all right, as children of God to show love to our brother. Now look at what it says. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not cover, covet, sorry, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Okay? All right. Now, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Look at verses of chapter 14. And uh, we'll begin reading here a few more verses. He's going to build on, chapter 14 is building on what we just read in chapter 13 about love, loving one another, love being the fulfillment of the law. And this is, here's, here's a description of that in Romans chapter number 14. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now we're going we're to talk a little bit about legalism, how this pertains to legalism. But the Apostle Paul here is saying, hey, look, there's going to be differences among you, okay? Um, when he's talking about eating, eating here, uh, the context is, you know, there were some who were eating meat that was, had been offered to false gods. And they were eating that meat. Um, they were just thinking, hey, you know what? It's meat. It's not going to defile you. There were others that were, there were other believers that were like, hey, that meat was sacrificed to a false god. I'm not going to touch it. And he's, he's saying, look, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, number one, understand that you're going to answer to God for whatever you do either way. You answer to God, but why are you so concerned about what he's eating? You have your own belief, follow it. You're free to follow your own conscience, okay? Then he uses the idea here of one day being uh, alike. Others observing certain days. There are, there are, there's a lot of disparity even amongst Christians. You know, should we observe Christmas? All right. And there's people that are like, oh, it's wicked. It's horrible. It, you know, it, it's associated. And again, it's got a lot of associations with the mass 
and we're definitely against the, the mass. I don't want anybody to be confused about that. It's got associations with pagan rituals and all this kind of thing. And so there's some people that stay away from it. There are other people that say, hey, you know what? Everything that we do and observe is tainted. And, and this is a day that we can uh, re be reminded of that moment when Jesus Christ came into this world. And, and that's why they're celebrating that day. But either way, the Bible says, whatever you do, follow your conscience, but you need to be really careful about judging somebody else. They're God's servant. They're not your servant. That's what he says. He said, why are you judging another man's servant? They answer to God and you answer to God. Now we read on here because, you know, we can say there's biblical principles to, to help us with all this, but w what's at stake here is our attitude. Everybody not following me? What's at stake here is pride. What's at stake is people who go around and say, I'm more spiritual because I don't eat meat. I follow the Old Testament dietary laws. Or I don't do this. Or I don't do that. Are you with me? Now we've got what we would call a legalistic attitude. It's a spiritual pride that somehow thinks that my standing with God is better because I keep these list of rules. If anybody follow what I'm saying? Whether that, whether that be for salvation or sanctification. Now this works both ways. And, we'll, and I don't want to get too far ahead. Let's read some more scriptures. Amen. Um, it says this, verse number 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. This is such an important truth. Christian believer, would you realize that no man is an island unto himself? What you do affects others. What you do influences others. Are you with me? And we ought to have a love for our brother, even to the point of saying, hey, you know what? If this is going to offend my brother, that's what he's got to say here, then I'm not going to do it. Right? Um, and, 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 and so he says here, for none of us liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Amen. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that I, he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? Boy, isn't that what legalism does? Defiled. Set at naught. That's what we do. We'll say things from the pulpit like, God could never bless you. You heathen, have you ever listened to this song with pleasure? <laughs> you know, who wicked? We must separate. Now, again, we're going to, I'm going to talk about a desire for holiness. And, and, and we're going to talk about where separation is. Okay, but, but I'm talking about here a spiritual attitude that is more concerned about what Brother David or what Brother Brian has been doing this week and not a spiritual concern about what has my heart been like this week. Have I been holy, right? All right, ask yourself, have you been listening to that song with pleasure? If you're going to ask anybody, you follow what I'm saying? So, again, man, I keep getting ready to preach and we're supposed to read the scriptures and Look at what he says. For as it is written, or, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is a sobering thought. More sobering than standing before the preacher. When we were in Utah, the, um, the Mormons, I learned a lot about how they operate. And every year, they have to get a temple recommend for their, from their priest or their, their local bishop. And in order to get this temple recommend, they have to go sit down. It's very much like the Catholic confessional, but they have to sit down for a one-on-one -on -one interview with their bishop. And the bishop asks them very, very pointed questions. In fact, too pointed, in my opinion. Did you do this? Did you, that? Did you do that? Have you done this? Have you done that? All right, um, man, you talk about 
Now, I, I'm going to I'm going to tell you right now. There's so much lying that goes on in that meeting. <laughs> it's not even funny, man. How much lying that goes on, and and uh, and you know, but the ones that you know uh, you know are honest, and they don't measure up. Boy, they come away either feeling guilty about lying in the meeting so that they could keep their temple recommend and good, their temple recommend in good standing or or they tell the truth and they'll get that temple recommend revoked or they'll be put on a kind of a probation or whatever it is but they can't measure up but here's the thing that's horrible and i thank god that's not in the bible we should never do that but let me tell you something what do you think it's going to be like when you stand before god we don't need that because we are going to stand before God, okay? It's none of my business what's going on in your mind or in your home. Now, I preach from the Word of God because it is God's business. Are you with me? And so I'll tell you what God says about these things so you can examine your own heart and your own home and your own mind, amen? And I believe that's, that's the job of the pastor. I believe that's what the preaching, the Word of God is for. But it's not me intervening in your home. You don't answer to me. You don't answer to any other man or any other priest. You answer to God. And that's what he says. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably? Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know, something that's missing in a lot of conservative churches, true righteousness, true peace, true joy, it's not present in a legalistic church. Okay, um, I'm just saying that it's not, and, and that doesn't just have to be a conservative church. Okay, you could walk into a an emerging church, or you could walk into one of these, you know, new evangelical churches, and you'll find very much the same spirit. And we'll uh, hopefully get to that if if the Lord allows. Uh, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. And things wherewith one may edify another. Isn't church so much more exciting when we have peace amongst ourselves? Isn't church so much more exciting when we're building each other up and we're helping each other than, than, than when we come and we criticize? Oh, look at, they're doing that. Oh, look at this, they're doing that. Okay, it is good, and this is what, this is what it says. For meat... Destroy not the work of God. <laughs> One way or the other. Why are you going to let meat offered to us, you know, offered to idols? Why are you going to let that destroy the work of God? Whether you think we should eat it or whether or not you think we shouldn't eat it, you're for meat, destroy not the work of God. That's what he says right here. And by the way, we can destroy the work of God over these kind of issues. Now, can I go down this rabbit trail or no? Oh, no. How about somebody wake up Brother Brian? No, he will. <laughs> this, uh, I'm going to go down a rabbit trail, brother. This is interesting stuff here. I will chase this rabbit, and we'll just, you know, maybe it will lead to some discussion later. Here's what I find fascinating. In Acts chapter number 15, when they, the, the Jerusalem council, remember Jerusalem council, right? And they, they were trying to decide if the law of Moses still applied. If you remember there, they said, all right, you don't have to follow the law, okay, for salvation. James got up and declared. But he said, here, here are four things that the Gentiles must not do. And then he lists a, as a commandment, you're not to eat things strangled or things offered uh, to, to sacrifice or blood or, or whatever. But the indication is, is no association whatsoever with anything that came from 
idolatrous practices. Okay, Acts chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 14, Paul says, that's a matter of spiritual liberty. Fascinating. <laughs> what changed? All right, what, cha what changed? Paul here is saying, hey, that's a matter of spiritual liberty. However, your love for your brother ought to be such that, hey, whatever, we, we may have disagreement here, but we're going to agree not to let that destroy the work of God that he's trying to accomplish in this assembly. You with me? So, you know, Acts four, uh, Romans 14 trumps Acts chapter number 15. Acts chapter number 15. A lot, a lot of fascinating stuff there. So we'll talk about that later, all right? I'll, I'll come back onto the path here and uh, cut that out of the, cut that, <laughs> cut that out of the video. And be like, well, what are you trying to say? It's a fascinating thing. Paul says here, it's a, it's a matter of spiritual liberty. Look at what he says here at the, at the end of this chapter. All right. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is, is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin, is sin. Okay, let, let, let's read a few more passages. Go with me over to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5, quickly if you would. Um, so much to say, so little time to say it. Galatians chapter number 5, beginning in verse number 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. By the way, the outcome here of spirit-filled living is, is that you won't, you won't do the lust of the flesh, okay? Um, and, 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 and righteous living, holy living, is what God is after. It's what God is seeking in your life, okay? So, so let, let's just state, state that from the very beginning here. As we talk about legalism, that it does matter how you behave. Your actions matter. Uh, but why? you behave that way also matters. You with me? So if you're trying to be holy because you think that's going to make you more lovable to God, then you've just disparaged the love of God. You with me? If you think, well, God cannot love me in my ugliness, so I've got to clean up my life so he can, be, so he can love me. You know what you've just done? You've just done despite unto the love of God. Okay, can I tell you, he didn't love you because you were lovable? He didn't. He didn't love me because I was so lovable. Because I was so, you know, just wonderful. And, and God just looked down from heaven and thought, wow, it, it, it'll, be, it, it'll be my privilege. Oh, heaven would be just so much more greater if I include him. No, no. All right. He looked down. He saw a very, very wicked, rotten sinner. And God's love is so amazing that even when he saw us while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Amen? Isn't that wonderful love? That's amazing. It's hard for us to comprehend because we love people who love us. Okay? We love because of, a, or, you know, maybe a relationship that's established, your, your kids. I mean, some kids, right? We will jokingly say, man, that's a face only a mother could love. All right, maybe some of you have heard that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know. I don't know. Maybe I've heard that once or twice too, right? And, and you know, our understanding of love is just that, oh yeah, of course that mother's going to love that. Only a mother could love that. <laughs> but, 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 but we understand love in, in a different way. God's love is so far above because he loved us in our worst moment. Amen? He loved us when we were totally unlovable. All right. And again, the Mormons struggle with that out in Salt Lake City. They think, well, God loved us because we're his children. Well, we're not his children. We're enemies of God. And he loved us still. All right. Now, look at what it says here. 
Uh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. You know what that is? That's legalism. Okay? That's a desire for me to be glorified by my holy living. He says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another envying one another, all right? And, of course, that's always the outcome of legalism is there's provocation. There's picking at each other. There's nitpicking. Oh, we're better than them. Oh, oh do you know they had the friends come in and sing? Oh, man, those wicked people. Like, okay, what in the world? You with me? Um, this is self-glory. But then we, in turn, turn around and be like, oh, look at them. Do you know who he had in? <laughs> and, and on and on it goes as we're more concerned about other people and provoking and envying one another while we're all looking for self-glory, vain glory. That's legalism. So, so let's dive into this um, uh, tonight. By way of review, as we talk about defeating legalism, first of all, if we're going to have the victory, we have to define legalism biblically. We must define things biblically, and we have done that. We've, we've, we've shown that legalism is the belief that law-keeping is the basis of our acceptance with God. Now, that's bad. Now, whether, it doesn't matter whether it's for salvation or sanctification. If we think that our performance is the basis of God's favor, of God's grace, that he's bestowing grace, love, favor on us because of how well we're doing, then we become legalistic. Um, it results, therefore, in a spiritual pride that is enamored with self and not with God's amazing grace. Uh, just talking not too long ago with, with, with somebody, and we're just, we're just talking about if we're not careful, we become so saturated with self. We become, even in our salvation experience, it just becomes so focused on our experience, and we're not enamor, enamored with God's amazing grace. Now, I talk with folks all the time out in the street. I'm street preaching, you know. I want to talk about salvation. And they'll sit there and they'll talk with me for two, three, four, sometimes five minutes and won't say one word about Jesus. Not one word about Jesus. It's all about them. It's all about what they've done. It's all about how good they've been and, and what they haven't done and all this. And I'll just sit there, I'll nod my head and, and I'll try to, you know, try to get their understanding. And some of these folks may be saved, but because they've not been discipled and they've not really been, you know, taught in the word and, and so forth, they, they've come to this place where they're just filled with pride, like the Pharisee who said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not as these other men. Remember that story in the Bible, you know? I'm not like the, that publican over there, you know, and I give tithes and I pray twice daily and I do this and I do that. Meanwhile, the guy, the publican over there, you know, was, you know, he was broken. I said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went away justified. Are you with me? All right, so if we're going to have the victory over legalism, first of all, we need to define it biblically. We noted that legalism is not the absence of law or rules. All right, please be clear about that. Legalism is not the absence of laws or rules or commandments. There's still a whole lot of commandments in this book, even in the New Testament, <laughs> all right? In fact, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my 
commandments. Keep my commandments. Legalism is not the absence of rules. You know, these people run around today and they're like, we're not under the law, but under grace. And what they really mean is, we can do whatever we want to do. We don't have no more rules. They're deceived. You with me? They're deceived. That's not what not being under the law, but under grace means. What, what, let me, legalism is what says my standards are higher than yours so that I'm a better Christian than you. <laughs> All right, that's what legalism says. Legalism says that my ways are better than your ways. You know, I was talking with somebody the other day, and they were like, yeah, you know, at my church, we don't, we don't judge people based on, you know, X, Y, Z, you know. And, and, and the thing was is that, I, you know, we were talking, I, I, to be honest with you, it just came out of nowhere, but I, they were really proud about that. <laughs> you know what they were saying? They were saying, our ways are better than your ways. And so even in a way, even in a church that, you know, pretty much the only rule they had was that there are no rules, but that was a rule itself, and they felt like they were pretty, they, they were more spiritual than everybody because they have the right rule. They have the right spirit. It's all about, oh, we're, we're, so, we're, we're better. You should come. Our church is the best place because we don't do this. Look, look, look. Why don't you just be glad that you can come to a place where Jesus Christ is lifted up? Amen? Why don't you just say, boy, I, I just love the fact that we talk about Jesus and we talk about his word, and, we, and we're encouraged to walk with him and to, and to live in a way that pleases him. Amen? Uh, not, not be one of these places where it's like, oh, we're proud because we do this or we don't do that or uh, whatnot. This is legalism that creeps into every kind of church, whether it be conservative or liberal. So that's first of all. Secondly, we've differentiated legalism from hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy is bad. We talked about that. Jesus condemned the Pharisees over and over again, but hypocrisy and legalism are not the same thing. Hypocrisy is having a double standard, all right? Replacing God's commands with the traditions of men and seeking man's approval above God's approval. All these things uh, Jesus condemned the Pharisees for, all right? And we shouldn't have them, don't get me wrong, but we differentiated between legalism and hypocrisy. Um, true story, the storm was coming in this afternoon. The wind was really picking up, and I was at my office and looking at the rain coming down, and I just started praying. I was talking with the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you for causing it to rain upon the just and the unjust, and I pray that it will give life to the corn. I was looking at the corn because it was looking pretty parched and so forth, and and, uh, but I was looking at the wind and, and, and how dark it was. And I said, Lord, please help this not to be, you know, destructive. The storms can be destructive. And uh, I said, Lord, just in wrath, remember mercy. And I prayed that. And then I went to get ready for church and everything. And while I was getting ready, Alan come down. He banged on the door. He's like, Dad, Dad, you won't believe it. A big giant branch just fell right on our sidewalk. And, uh, I mean, it is huge. I got pictures I'll show you. It missed our house by, like, this much. It missed our house by inches. Big, big, giant, round tree branch. <laughs> and it, like, it went almost all the way up the, the stone steps. So it fell in between our cars and the house and didn't land anything. So I'm, I'm hoping that when we go home, nobody has a tree on your house or on your garage. Uh, God is still good, amen, even if you do, uh, we'll praise him for it, but, but I, I thought, man, uh, praise the Lord for his protection there. All right, um, so differentiating that. Then thirdly, we've discovered that we all have a tendency uh, uh, to, to set up ourselves as the standard of righteousness. That's where we were kind of last, last time I concluded our sermon. We all have a tendency to set up ourselves as the standard. And that's what we have to be careful of because legalism will make ourselves the standard of righteousness. And we are all comfortable with our rules, okay? We're comfortable with our way of doing things. And if we're not careful, what ends up happening is, is we look to everybody to the left of where we are and we're like, those licentious people. 
Those wicked people, those worldly, that was a term when I was growing up. Those worldly, you're just being worldly. Man, I, I remember sitting in the youth group thinking, oh, Lord, please, I don't want to be one of them worldly teenagers, you know, because, wow, those worldly. And, of course, it was everybody that was left of whatever the preachers, you know, where he was comfortable with. And then, of course, there's always going to be people to the right of us, too, and we're going to look at them, and we're going to call them legalists. Okay, everybody understand what I'm saying? So who's the standard of righteousness? We are. And that's what we have to be very, very, very careful of saying. We are not the standard of righteousness. Jesus Christ is the standard. Amen? And uh, if we find ourselves constantly looking over here and being like, oh, they're licentious, and then anyone else who's kind of got a bigger or, or, or maybe a stronger stand on us or something more, more strict or whatever it might be, and we look at them and they, they, we call them legalists, We've got that beam coming out of our own eye if we're not being careful, all right? And so then we th we see here in talking about this that uh, in, we need to uh, be aware of whether or not we've set ourselves up as the standard of righteousness, okay? We all have rules and standards. Let me just say that right off the bat. Everybody does. Everybody has a way of doing things. Everybody has things that they're comfortable with and things that are not comfortable with music okay we all have a standard of, of music that we're comfortable with and one that we're not comfortable with okay and 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 of course if we're not careful everybody to the left of us is worldly anything more to the right of us is legalistic right people look at us and say well you guys sing the hymns you guys are legalists all right and and if we're not careful we look at anybody that doesn't use a hymnal and we're just like oh look at them uh they're just uh feeding the flesh or whatever it might be um, God help us to be more concerned with our own heart. Um, our standards should be consistent with biblical principles, and what we really should be looking at is what our attitude is towards those who have differing standards than our own. Isn't that what Romans 14 was all about? How are you going to treat your brother? Okay? What's your attitude towards your brother? Say, pfft. Can't believe he doesn't eat at restaurants that serve alcohol. Doesn't he know that we're living in the age of grace? Meanwhile, the other brothers over there are like, what kind of worldly reprobate eats at Applebee's? Heathen, what is this world coming to? And hey, this is this is this is churches. Cross the board, right? This is, this is how it is. And you know what nobody, nobody's really examining is, is, why do I have such a caustic attitude towards my brother in Christ? Why is it that I, 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 I feel so much, there's no peace here, okay? Um, are you threatened by the fact that he eats at Applebee's? Are you threatened by the fact that he doesn't? Okay, are you going to destroy the work of God here in this church because you found out a brother disagrees with you about some subject? Like, that's it. That's it. I can't work with him. He gone. All right. We have to be careful of these things. Um, it's not hypocrisy to observe a higher standard in order to follow rules and not offend those who do have standards. We are not responsible for their attitude. We are responsible for ours. Jobs have differing standards and dress codes. How many of you have worked for more than one employer? Okay. How many of you would say that jobs have, the employers are different. I've worked with some that have had a whole week of training. They don't even let you touch a job on your own until you've gone through a whole week of training, gone through the employee handbook, they've given you a uniform, and they've said, you got to show up to work in that uniform. You don't come, you know, with your greasy t-shirt on, right? I've also worked for guys that, man, the first day on the job, they were like, here you go, man. <laughs> Off and running, man. Right, maybe maybe that's a that's a big disparity. But if you've worked for multiple employers, you know there are some that are very detailed and how they want things done and how you're going to look while you're doing it. 
And guess what? If you wanted to stay employed by them, you followed their rules. Sorry. Right? You wore that uniform. You didn't look at them and say, I'm sorry, I just can't be a hypocrite because I, I don't wear this uniform anywhere else. I don't, I don't wear this uniform to bowling. I don't use this uniform to go to church. I just feel like I would be hypocritical if I worked for you and I wore this uniform. It just I would not be being true to myself. You didn't say that. Come on now. Some of you are looking at me like, uh-oh, pastor. <laughs> You followed the rules. And you know what? It wasn't hypocrisy and it wasn't legalism. That they would have the audacity to make you drive their work truck with their name on it. You with me? It wasn't legalism. There's a, there's a, there's a, a spirit, though, that has crept into our churches where all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, Pastor, I just, I just feel like I'd be hypocritical if I observed the church's dress code while I was singing in the choir because that's just not my personal standard and I, I don't dress like that all the time in every place and I just feel like I'm not being true to myself. Can we understand like there's an appropriateness and following rules is not bad, it's not legalism. Sometimes we have to examine our own heart. What is our attitude towards this? Are you with me? Um, and vice versa. Sometimes we, 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 you know, you get into places and I think the rules are more important than the word of God. And that's a problem. The world teaches that you must be true to yourself. This is ungodly. God teaches you to love your brother in Christ even if he's weaker. Amen. You say, well, that's not my own personal belief. Yeah, but if, you, if it means not offending Brother Charlie, God expects you to not offend Brother Charlie. The world says, oh, you got to be true to yourself. Everybody else just has to deal with it. Right? Isn't that what, it, isn't that what they teach? You walk into these, these, these schools nowadays, and it's a shame. Because you see the way the kids, their appearance, their attitude, how they carry themselves, their behavior. And you know what they act? They act like, I'm just being true to myself. You don't like it. Take a hike. That's your problem, not mine. That doesn't flow with God. That's not a Christ-like attitude. You with me? And we shouldn't have that attitude in the church. It shouldn't be one of these things like, well, so-and-so can just lump it. So-and-so is your brother in Christ. Christ died for him or her. Praise God, amen. Now, I have this marker. I'm hesitating to use it because of the color pink. As I talk about legalism, there's still something in me <laughs> that says, I cannot... I cannot be a fundamentalist and use a pink highlighter. <laughs> let, let me just talk a little bit about this, and, and, and I, hope this is, I hope this is helpful. I hope as you think about this, man's relationship with God was never determined by our law keeping. Amen? From the very beginning when Adam sinned, you know how God came in and dealt with it? He gave a promise. He said the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. He said the solution to this uh, the sin problem and the solution to the salvation of man's soul is not you doing better. It's not you going and keeping the commandment that you broke to begin with. It's not you give, me giving you a list of rules and you keeping those from this point. No, the solution to all of this is I'm giving you a promise. I'm going to send a Savior and you're going to have to believe that promise. Amen. Galatians talks about this. So God God, the man's relationship with God was never determined, never, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, not ever, not pre-flood, post-flood, uh, antediluvian. You, you, you can use all the terms you want. Man's relationship with God has always been based off of faith. God giving a promise and saying, you take me at my word. 
I will be faithful to it. It's never been about your effort. It's never been about my effort or Adam's effort or Eve's effort or law keeping or anything. Amen. And so when we, when we, when we consider that, uh, this idea of law and grace comes into the relationship here is clear. Now we've read these verses in Romans, all right, chapter number eight, Romans chapter number four, 13 and 14, uh, um, God, what, what God get, was saying in the Old Testament was that man, God gave the law as a, I, I'm going to call this like a restraint. You know, you got man here, okay, and he's sinful and he's wicked. And so God, when he made man perfect, Man was to love God and he was to love his neighbor as himself. Amen. That's what God expects this guy to do. But once he fell, he became a sinner by nature, became selfish. All right. And, and God knew that there was no way that we can expect this man. We'll call him Andy so that nobody is offended. Andy cannot be expected to love his neighbor as himself because he's fallen, okay? And he has a sin nature and he lives in a body of sin. And so he's gonna be selfish. And, and if he can get away with it, he'll steal. If he can get away from, with it, he'll kill. If he can get away from it, he'll, he'll commit adultery. Uh, he'll do all of these things. And so God had to give the law, not to save Andy, but to put a restraint on my behavior. Because my, our behavior has always mattered to God. God doesn't want us living wicked. Boy, the thunder, lightning, screams. <laughs> Very interesting church service this evening. <laughs> wicked Andy running around, somebody like trying to rein him in, right? That, that was the purpose of the law. It was, in essence, a replacement of love. Now, I say replacement. It was God saying, look, because Andy will not love me, as he ought to. I have to say, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Did I get that right? Because Andy will not love God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. I have to tell him, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. He had to give the law to restrain. But, that, but, but restraining was never God's purpose or intent from the beginning. It was just given as a temporary hold until Jesus could come. Now, why would Andy need grace? And what would be different about grace? What would be different about grace was, is not the fact that Andy would have restraint or rule. The law is ru ruling. And, and by the way, the strength of the law, you know, is that fear of punishment. That fear of, hey, man, if I commit adultery, I get caught. I'm going to get stoned. They're going to kill me. So even though I may not, even though I may want that in my heart, I mean, didn't Jesus talk about looking on a woman with lust in your heart, right? Even though I may have that in my heart, I'm, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to get stoned. That was the strength of all that fear. And it, but it's all external, external. But see, God's plan is for grace to come right here. Oh, isn't that neat? That's why we had the pink, right? It's for the heart. All right, now though, if you know your scriptures, you know that what I'm telling you right now is the truth. That God says, I'm going to, I'm going to have a work of grace in Andy's heart. And I'm going to put my law not on tables of stone anymore like he did with Moses. But I'm actually going to put my law in a desire to, to live that way and to live righteous and holy. I'm going to put it in Andy's heart by my grace. Amen? By my grace, through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to come in and I'm going to change Andy from the inside out. And Andy is going to love his neighbor. He will, therefore, and that's why the Bible says love is the fulfilling of the law. Because of this law here, there's, there's no stealing. There's no 
There's no lying, right? But now, here's Andy. He's not under the law anymore because he has grace in his heart. And because the working of God's grace is in Andy's heart, the outcome is the same, only this time it's being motivated internally the way that God had always intended, not externally. There's no stealing. There's no lying, or at least there shouldn't be, amen, right? And there's a desire for me to keep that law, but it's coming from inside. See, these both were, were, were the means to altering behavior. This means is, was better, and this is what God intended all along. But Jesus Christ had to die on the cross, shed his blood, and raise again so that God could send his Holy Spirit and bring that grace inside. And that's why he's saying that the law reigned, but in the fullness of the time, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son. Amen. And then at that moment, the Holy Spirit of God comes and he indwells us and he changes us from the inside out. But in either way, it results in me doing what I should do, doing what God wanted me to do from the beginning, to love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. Okay? And that's what God wants for all of us, for Tom, Jim, Brian, Dave, Charlie, Gary. Pick on the men. <laughs> And the rest of the men, I can't, don't have time to name you all. <laughs> he wants you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he wants you to love your neighbor as yourself. And he sent his Holy Spirit into your life, not only to save your soul, but to take the grace of God and to enable you to live the life that God wants you to live, to live the life that Jesus Christ lived, who fulfilled all things that pleased the Father. And it's... Every bit is true for the ladies here as well. Amen. So this is, this is what he's teaching. Okay. Um, and so these are two different methods. This is not the method anymore. That was only a temporary method until Jesus came. This is the method. But the outcome is the same. This is what the Bible means when it says we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Now, can I, let me just share a few verses with you. Some of these you should know, some of you don't. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Romans 6, 17, But God be thanked, thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, if you would turn over to that passage of Scripture, I think we'll... We're probably in there tonight, but wow, what an amazing passage in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Hope I'm not boring you. I uh, hope this is making sense as we talk about legalism, as we talk about what God is doing, the grace of God working in us. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. And uh, let's read a few verses here. Verse number three, for ye are not, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Oh, I'm in First Corinthians, sorry. Let me get over to Second Corinthians chapter number three. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious... 
so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. You understand? He's, he's comparing and contrasting the Old and the New Testaments. And he's saying, look, when Moses went up into the mountain of God, it was, it was kind of storming, probably a lot more than this. The Bible says it was darkness came down and there was, there was thunderings and there was lightning and there was fire that came down. And God, with his own finger, engraved the Ten Commandments on tables of stone. And Moses, who was up there observing all this, in the presence of God, as God gave this letter of the law, Moses, who was observing this, when he comes down off the mount, the Bible says that his face, his countenance, was so changed, it was so bright, that the children of Israel said, man, you've got to wear a veil. We can't behold this. You've got to put a veil over this. And, and Paul is referencing that right here in this passage. And he was saying, hey, look, you think that was something? That was temporary. That was just what God was doing. And God was going to do something far greater in writing the law on our hearts. He said, you think that's glorious? You think that was that changed Moses' countenance so much? How much more do you think the Holy Spirit of God indwelling in your spirit and bringing eternal life in the life of Christ, how much more glorious do you think that's going to radiate from our countenance? That's what he's saying. Back at, read, read through that whole thing. He's just, he's just saying, wow, you think that was something and that was temporary. That was to be done away with. This is far more glorious than what God is doing in the hearts of men and women today through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And it should be evident to everybody around us. Look, I mean, it, you, you, it, read on the, the rest of the verse. We got we to gotta conclude. I always save the good stuff to last, and then we run and raise him through it, right? It says this, But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Verse 16, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Talking about Israel. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Boy, you read through this chapter, it, 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 it'll take away the spiritual pride. You get, he's saying, look, because you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, you can look and you can see God. And when you do, he's going to change you into his image. His image, more and more, being converted, transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The law of God being written on your heart. The desire for God and for righteousness coming from within. Hallelujah. Not, not, as, not in an, an attempt to lift us up, but as a, as a way to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ through the Spirit working in our lives. So, so in conclusion... We must determine to remain humble and reliant on God's grace while upholding whatever standard we deem scripturally sound. The key is to remain humble. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. We need to be reminded day in and day out that without Jesus, we have nothing. Amen? And without his Holy Spirit in, in us, in this flesh, dwelleth no good thing. We need to keep our eyes on him. He needs to be everything, our all and all. It's right to have standards and rules. Everybody has them. We must be careful not to set them up as equal with God's commands. But instead, remain reliant on the grace of God. The grace of God will teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The grace of God will teach 
bad Andy how to live in a way that pleases God. The grace of God will. Okay? So that bad Andy doesn't need the external strengths on them. Now, there, I get in the flesh, you get in the flesh, people that are not saved who are, yeah, they, they, you know, you got to restrain them, and the only way to restrain them is externally. But what they need to be is they need to be transformed internally by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And Christians need to learn to live in light of that truth. Learn to be comfortable in your own walk with God. That's the last thing I'll say tonight, okay? Um, I don't know if this makes sense to you or not, but I, I become, over time, and I'm not the standard. I don't want to lift myself up as a standard. Amen? Jesus Christ is. But I become comfortable with my own walk with God. I'm not threatened by the fact that other people have different standards than me. Some people have higher standards some people have lower standards. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that in my heart, I've learned that I can love them either way. Those that have higher standards than me, those who have, all right, I just got mixed up, but those who have different standards than me. But yeah, at the same time, I don't feel threatened to throw my walk with, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable in my walk with God and my pursuit of holiness, with the Holy Spirit of God leading and the grace of God leading in me, in me in my life, I can be around people that don't agree with me, and I can still love them in the Lord. While at the same time, I don't feel like I need to change and throw out how I live my life. All right? And I, and I think if you're comfortable in your walk with God, and by comfortable, I'm just saying, if you're drawing your... Accept, whatever you're looking to for acceptance, is that coming from the Holy Spirit of God? Then, then you're not looking for the acceptance of man and other men or, or looking to build yourself up by putting other men down or, or women, take, take your choice, you know what I'm saying? Pursue God, pursue Him. And, and, and whatever set of rules you live, live by, have an attitude of humility in it. Base it on the Bible. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, the Bible says. Know why you believe and practice what you believe and practice from God's word. Have a spirit of obedience when you come here and, and somebody else is the one that set the standard. The, 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 uh, the, the, the Christian attitude towards that is one that says, hey, I can, I can willingly submit to that. All right? Um, it, it, that's what God desires from his people for the work of God. I don't want to be an offense or for the work of God. I don't want to just come in and, and, and cause problems over just because they set the rule there. Most of the time, it, it is a gray area, if you would, all right? Um, we just, we base it off a of biblical principle and we do it for unity. And we'll talk one last lesson, I think. And, I, and I'll give you some reasons for why or where, how to base what you believe in the, in the, in the rules and the standards that we have biblically off the Bible and how to have a biblical attitude for them. But right now, let's just understand that not being under the law, but being under grace means that God's grace is going to come in and teach you how to live holy, righteously, and godly from the inside out so that you don't need the restraint. Amen? And you, we got to need to look to that spirit of grace to teach us that. So, all right, let's, um, let's take some prayer requests and then